Hey up everyone. So today on the channel, I want to do something a little bit different and give you a top 10 listicle. The category is top 10 movies from 2023 that shockingly received zero Oscar nominations. I want to make this a regular video every year. In fact, if this is something that you would like me to see do with other Oscar years, you know, retroactively, then yeah, do hit that like button and let me know in the comment section below if that's something that you'd like to see more of on the channel in the future. I wanted to make this video because even though I am an Oscars and awards season fanboy, I think it's good to acknowledge that the Academy don't always get it right when it comes to the films that they nominate. Sometimes they get it wrong. Every single year there are several films which, despite showing excellence in certain departments or just being an incredible movie overall, fail to get any recognition at the Oscars. For whatever reason, they just slip through the cracks, whether that be the timing of the movie's release, whether it's got the support and the backing and the money of a big strategic Oscars campaign from the distributor or it could be a lack of enthusiasm when the film was released either from critics or audiences it might not have done well at the box office or it could be a film that was largely misunderstood when it first came out but yeah in the 96 years that the Academy has been around there have been hundreds if not thousands of movies that have got absolutely zero recognition for nominations. So I thought it'd be interesting to discuss 10 films from 2023 that were shockingly excluded from Oscar nominations, plus a few honorable mentions as well, and discuss why they were goose-egged. So yeah, as we make our way through this top 10, I'll say which categories I think each film could have been nominated the Oscars for, and then I'll give you some reasons as to why I think they didn't end up getting nominated and why the film was completely shut out. Of course, if you guys have anything you want to add, any other categories you think these films should have been nominated for, or any reasons you think it might have been shut out, do let me know in the comment section down below. I love hearing what you guys have to say. Plus, if this video inspires any of you guys that are watching to check out any of these overlooked films this awards season, then I feel like I'm doing the film community a bit of good. So yeah, please do check out these films they all have qualities that are worth celebrating and I do have in-depth reviews for all the films in this list uh, on the channel so yeah feel free to check those out. Okay so at number 10 we're gonna go really far back into the early days of 2023 and kick things off with Ben Affleck's Air. From when this film was released Air always seemed like a maybe for Oscars attention but sadly Air didn't get much traction over awards season apart from a couple nods at Golden Globes and Critics Choice Awards. I personally was always on the fence about Air getting any Oscar nominations because I did find it a very safe and conventional film. It didn't really have much grit to it, but it was well made, well acted, and very entertaining. So what categories do I think it could have been nominated for at the Oscars? Let's start with a big one, Best Picture. Air is the type of crowd-pleasing, feel-good, dadtastic film that did have the potential to squeeze into Best Picture. It's a very light and likable film, like Top Gun Maverick or Ford v Ferrari. So yeah, from the get-go, there was always a pathway for Air to make it into Best Picture. I also think it's not implausible that Air could have made it into Best Original Screenplay. It was the debut screenplay of Alex Convery, but it was a solid script. I thought it was a very funny screenplay, albeit a little bit sappy in places, but I also found it quite informative. Like, there were lots of, like, little nuggets of information about Nike and its competitors, which I found quite interesting. Infotainment. <laughs> it also got the original screenplay nomination at the Critics' Choice Awards as well. There was always that feeling that maybe Viola Davis could show up in Best Supporting Actress for her role as Michael Jordan's mom, Doris. It may have been a pretty small part, but Viola Davis always does so much with very little. Despite minimal screen time, she left her mark on the movie and she made an impact with audiences. And given that it was kind of a weak year for Best Supporting Actress, it's not impossible that Viola Davis could have just popped up out of the blue, but SAG didn't give her the nomination, and SAG loves Viola Davis, so it seemed less likely that the Oscars were going to give it to her at that point. And I genuinely think in a year where Best Supporting Actor wasn't as stacked with so many renowned, beloved actors that... There is a branch of the multiverse where Chris Messina could have got in for Best Supporting Actor for his performance in Air. His performance was a standout. I remember seeing his name in so many reviews for this film, and in the early days of the race, like there were some vocal, passionate people wanting to see Chris Messina get nominated for it, but it kind of feels like 
uh, Rachel McAdams and I, there, God, it's me, Margaret. Like, there is some passionate support, especially from critics, but it just didn't materialize. So why didn't Air get any Oscar nominations? What were the reasons it was goose-egged? For Air, I think what kept it from getting any Oscar nominations was a combination of factors. Normally, you do see a film like Air squeeze into a few categories at the Oscars, like Best Picture. With Best Picture, ever since they expanded the category from five nominees to upwards of 10, and now it's the mandatory 10, the Academy do like to show that the taste in Best Picture nominees isn't just pretentious art house films, okay? They like to show that they have an interest in fun, likable mainstream movies as well. So they usually give like one or two slots to those type of movies. And I would say that Air does fit the mold of a fun, likable, crowd-pleasing Best Picture nominee. And I think the slots that were reserved for the fun, crowd-pleasing Best Picture nominees this year end up going to bigger, fun, crowd-pleasing movies like Barbie, because it was the most profitable and most watched film of 2023. And also American Fiction is another fun film, but it also won the People's Choice Award at TIFF. So yeah, those slots were kind of taken up by those movies and there wasn't much room to squeeze Air in. There were just bigger and better fun movies to choose from this year. And I just think that Air didn't have the same passion behind it as say, an Everything Ever All At Once or an Avatar The Way of Water or Barbie or Top Gun Maverick. And at the end of the day, it is a film where the story is about the making of a shoe, okay? It's hard the hard-hitting, you know, important issue movie that the Academy usually likes to acknowledge in Best Picture. Granted, it tells a very simple story very well, but it's just not as ambitious as some of the other films that were nominated for Best Picture this year. Barbie and American Fiction are fun, yes, but they also have substance. Barbie might be a film about a doll, but it's so much more smarter and layered than that. You know, it's a film all about how impossible it is to be a woman in this modern age, as well as the oppressive nature of the patriarchy. American fiction satirizes how the heavily white liberal media treats black artists and black art. These films have something more meaningful to say than struggling business hits the big time when they acquire a star athlete. Yes, Air is an underdog story, but about one of the biggest, most recognizable sports brand in the world, Nike. They aren't seen as underdogs now by any means, so so it's hard to see why Oscar voters would think of it being an important movie. So yeah, I think Air failed to ignite at the Oscars because it's conventional, its thematic content wasn't that substantial or viewed as all that important, which resulted in a lack of passion for the film. And it did have to sustain relevancy for a long duration. This film came out back in April, and if you've got a film with an early release date, then you really need passion behind the film in order to sustain that relevancy all year long. A great example of this is Past Lives. That film had a lot of passion behind it. I think it deserved more Oscar nominations than it got, but yeah, it still managed to get some Oscars recognition because despite its early release date, you know, there was a lot of passion and support behind it. And Air was a fun film competing with other bigger fun films, which made a bigger splash culturally and had more important stuff to say. And it was an extremely competitive year as well for Best Picture. So I think all of that is why it got shut out of the Oscars. Next up at number nine, we have David Fincher's The Kill. Normally, David Fincher films get a lot of attention from the Academy. Mank got 10 nominations and won two. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo got five nominations and won one. The Social Network got eight nominations and won three. And The Curious Case of Benjamin Button got 13 nominations and won three. But David Fincher himself still hasn't won an Oscar. The Killer is an interesting blip on Fincher's history with the Oscars because even Alien 3 Fight Club, Seven, and Gone Girl all managed to get one Oscar nomination. The Killer joins the same club as Zodiac as a rare Fincher film to receive nil Oscar nominations. I did predict this outcome at Venice. After I watched The Killer, I wasn't confident that this was gonna be a film that would be the Academy's cup of tea. Like Zodiac, it's another dark character study about a killer. You'll see throughout Academy history that it's okay to play a killer, like they often do nominate them and they have one, but when it comes to the Academy acknowledging dark crime movies, it typically doesn't seem to be a genre 
that they go for. They often struggle to get recognized by the Academy. Sometimes it's just a little too dark for them. And yeah, as soon as I saw the killer, I did think to myself, ooh, this might be a bit too dark for them. But I did think it could potentially show up in a few below the line tech categories. So which categories do I think it could have been nominated for? Definitely sound. Okay, the sound design in this film was fantastic. The best example of this was that fight scene that takes place in the house. The sound in that was so brutal and realistic. Oh. I think the score was worthy of more discussion. Like I loved how pulsating it was from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. I'd also say that the cinematography was worthy of a nomination. I loved the grimy texture that Eric Messerschmidt brought to the movie through the cinematography. So what are the reasons why the killer was shut out? I think genre bias played a big part. Again, the grimy crime stories can struggle to break in at the Oscars. Heck, even David Finch's Gone Girl only managed to get one Oscar nomination for Rosamund Pike's performance. I also think the lack of fanfare didn't help. While generally the film was received positively by critics, many were quick to point out that the killer didn't feel like peak David Fincher. We have to hold him to his own high standards and the killer just didn't have the same rapturous response as say The Social Network or Gone Girl. So yeah, while it's by no means a bad film, it just wasn't being praised about to the usual Fincher level. Next up at number eight is Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. While Wes Anderson stands a decent chance of winning his first ever Oscar this year for his live action short, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, the Academy weren't as sweet on his other release this year, Asteroid City. Anderson's films have often been nominated at the Oscar, the peak of which was the Grand Budapest Hotel, which got nine nominations and ended up winning four, but Anderson didn't win any of those wins himself. They all went to like below the line categories like production design, score, costumes. But since Grand Budapest Hotel, the Academy's love for Anderson films seems to have cooled off. Of course, he does have the nomination for live action short for Henry Sugar, but his recent features like Asteroid City and also The French Dispatch failed to capture the Academy's attention like his previous features did. So what Oscar nominations do I think Asteroid City could have received? The two obvious ones are production design and costume design. When the first review came out for this film, the two things that everyone seemed to agree on were that the sets by Adam Stockhausen and the costume designs by Milena Cananero were immaculate. Nobody had a bad word to say about them. They were neat as a pin, so pleasing to the eye, dripping in warm pastels. Say what you want about the film overall, but it is very visually pleasing to the eye. And what were the reasons that Asteroid City was shut out? I think the main reason was probably familiarity. Audiences have become so accustomed to Wes Anderson's style and aesthetic that it just doesn't hit us with the same impact as it did in his previous films. Because when we go in to watch a Wes Anderson film, we know that it's gonna at least look good. It's expected. But we've kind of reached a point with Wes Anderson's films where it's this mindset of, oh, been there, done that, seen it before. Asteroid City also wasn't as buzzy as some of his previous films. While the reviews for the film were mostly positive, a lot of people were saying like it's still just a pretty and predictable Anderson film, okay? There was nothing all that surprising about it. A lot of people were just lukewarm with it. And because the film wasn't really being considered for any above the line categories, it probably failed to spark enough interest to get, you know, Academy voters to watch it for its below the line attributes like costumes and sets. I personally didn't like Asteroid City all that much. I thought it was fine. But even I probably would have given it a nomination for at least production design if I had an Oscars ballot. So next up at number seven, we've got Michael Mann's Ferrari. I saw this film at Venice and I said in my review for that film that I could see this film maybe getting one or two Oscar nominations, but it wouldn't surprise me if it ended up getting goose egged and lo and behold, that's what happened. It ended up getting nothing, which was a little bit of a surprise. Like I think a lot of people are anticipating for it at least to get a sound nomination. It was placing in all the precursors and the sound guilds. So it seemed assured that it was gonna get at least the sound nomination. But there was another category where a lot of people were predicting it would show up and that was Best Supporting Actress for Penelope Cruz because she got the nomination at SAG. She's an Academy favorite. She's got great international appeal and she has surprised with acting nominations before when she showed up for Parallel Mothers. Plus her performance in that film is very baity and grabby. Every scene she's in feels like an Oscars clip. But what were the reasons that Ferrari missed? I think it's quite simple actually. The movie just was very average. There wasn't a lot of buzz surrounding this film, which is strange because it is kind of a racing film. And you think that would generate some excitement, but 
really the reactions to this were very middling. It just kind of came and went and I'm sure that's what sort of like put a lot of people off from watching it and didn't bother to give it their vote. And again, I wasn't a big fan of Ferrari, but if it had got a sound and Best Supporting Actress nomination for Penelope Cruz, I would have been fine with that because those two elements of the film really do stand out. Next up at number six is another film I saw at Venice and it is Sofia Coppola's Priscilla. This film had a pretty warm response. The reviews are mostly positive and Kaylee Spaney ended up winning the Volpe Cup for Best Actress at Venice. So right out of the gate, there was some Oscar buzz for this film, but the thing with Sofia Coppola's movies is that they don't always resonate with the Academy. Often her films are overlooked. Last time she really got some attention was for Lost in Translation, which was what, 2004? So what categories do I think it could have been nominated for? Well, right off the bat, we have to say Kaylee Spaney for Best Actress, because as soon as she won the Best Actress Volpe Cup, it immediately put her in the mix, because previous winners of the Volpe Cup, like Emma Stone for La La Land, Olivia Common for The Favourite, they went on to win the Oscar. So yeah, we definitely had to consider her when she won the Volpe Cup. I also think it would have been deserved of a hair and makeup nomination as well as costume design. But what were the reasons that Priscilla was shut out? Well, when it comes to Kaylee Spaney, Best Actress was stacked this year. If Best Actress hadn't been so crowded this year, then there certainly would have been a pathway for Kaylee Spaney to get the nom. But she was a newcomer and this was kind of a breakout performance for her. And also, it's for a performance in a Sofia Coppola movie. So it's right out the gate, a very soft, delicate, um, internalized performance. And as we see, with the Oscars, they very rarely nominate performances like that. Another good example from this year is Greta Lee for Past Lives. She didn't get the nomination either, and arguably uh, Past Lives had a lot more buzz and passion surrounding it than Priscilla did. But yeah, a soft and gentle performance like Spaney's and Priscilla doesn't really do a whole lot to grab voters' attention. Another reason I'd say is familiarity, because just the previous year, Baz Luhrmann released Elvis, and because the two films around similar content of Elvis and Priscilla, maybe the Academy were just like, well, we've already like acknowledged, you know, Elvis, Elvis fever has calmed down. So yeah, they just weren't as wild and passionate about Sofia Coppola's uh, Priscilla movie as they were about Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. While they're very different films in terms of style and theme, it's still kind of like, oh, kind of done that recently, don't need to do it again. Next up at number five is an admittedly out of left field pick, but it is Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid. And now I agree, like right out the gate, this film had pretty much zero chance of getting any awards attention, but I do think it would have been deserving in a few categories, like production design or best actor for Walking Phoenix or even hair and makeup. Reasons why it was shut out at the Oscars? Well, like I said, it was never expected to get Oscars, but the, the main reason obviously is genre bias because this is one of those films that is really out there weird and uncomfortable to sit through. When a film is as polarizing as Bo is Afraid, it is going to struggle to get a majority of Academy voters to champion it in any department. Also, to be fair, none of Ari Aster's films have ever been nominated for an Academy Award, even though there was one very egregious snub that rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way, and that was Toni Collette for Best Actress for Hereditary. Don't you swear at me, you little don't you ever raise your voice at me. I am your mother. So yeah, it would have been bonkers for Bo is Afraid to be the first Ari Aster film to do it. But it's a shame because the quality of those categories that I mentioned this speaks for themselves. But yeah, if your film is intentionally weird or uncomfortable, then odds are the Academy aren't going to go for it. Next up at number four, we have Emerald Fennel's Saltburn. Fennel's previous and first film, Promising Young Woman, did pretty well at the Oscars. It got five nominations and won one for Best Original Screenplay, play, play for for Fennel herself. Her sophomore follow-up, Saltburn, did pretty well at BAFTA. It got five nominations, three of those were for performances, but it failed to pick up any at the Oscars. What do I think it could have been nominated for? It was an outside chance, but I did always think Barry Keoghan might just be able to squeeze into best acting now as a surprise, because, you know, he's really been on the rise the past few years with his previous Oscar nom last year for Banshees and Sharon. I do think Rosamund Pike could have been an outside chance for Best Supporting Actress as well. I think it also would have been deserving for uh, production design for Susie Davies, as well as cinematography for Linus Sangren. Oh, poor Linus Sangren. The man has made two of the most beautiful looking movies of the past two years, Babylon and Saltburn, and he's just 
failed to get any recognition from the Academy for such excellent work. Yep, justice for Linus. As for reasons, the main reason I would say that Saltburn failed to get any Oscar nominations is the same reason as Bo is Afraid. It was polarizing. It was too shocking for some voters to stomach. While some audience members like myself ate it up, other people found it gratuitous, vacuous, and uncomfortable. So while it probably did have some supporters, it probably just didn't have enough to get a majority in any of the categories that it was up for. It played well at BAFTA, but it was a British film, so it's understandable why it would have support here and not as much across the pond. At number three, we have Kelly Freeman Craig's Are You There God? It's Me, Margaret. In my opinion, this is definitely one of the most unsung films of 2023. It was a film that was really warmly received by both critics and audiences when it came out, but when it came to award season, it just absolutely fizzled out. Based on a book that has been beloved for decades by multiple generations of women, this film was funny, charming, earnest, and somehow didn't alienate male viewers, despite the fact it was a story all about a young girl going through puberty. But Margaret just did not take off this award season, which is a real shame. Where do I think it could have been nominated? Definitely for Best Adapted Screenplay for Kelly Freeman Craig. Best Actress for Abby Ryder Fortson, but again, it's the same as Kaylee Spaney. Real brand newcomer to the scene, up against a very stacked crowd this year, so it's understandable why she didn't get nominated. Best Supporting Actress for Rachel McAdams. There was a lot of passionate support for Rachel McAdams in the critics groups, but when it came to the precursors, it just didn't really happen. And also some people thought Kathy Bates was also worthy of a supporting actress nomination. I also would have given it a nomination for costume design because Anne Roth just captures the 70s so beautifully through the costumes. And what were the reasons that Margaret was shut out? I would say timing, because this film did come out quite early in the year and it didn't have quite enough fanfare to sustain that distance of award season. Also, it felt like there was a lack of a strong campaign from Lionsgate Films. I really wish they had done more with their campaign for this film. I also think that it's probably a film that was viewed by some voters as something that's a bit too tweeny and cutesy wootsy. This was a warm, cuddly, fluffy film about the female coming of age experience and maybe to some viewers they just didn't view it as, you know, serious enough. But yeah, I love this film and I'm gutted it didn't get as much love as it deserved. At number two, we have the film which probably stings me the most that it received zero Oscar nominations. If you've been watching my channel, you'll know this was my favorite film of 2023. I have gushed about this film so much. It is, of course, Andrew Haig's All of Us Strangers, one of the most acclaimed films of 2023. I can take some comfort in knowing that this film was at least cherished by BAFTA, because it did get six BAFTA nominations, but yeah, the Oscars, for whatever reason, didn't go for it. What Oscar nominations do I think it deserved? Well. Where do I start? Best Picture, Best Director for Andrew Haig, Best Adapted Screenplay for also for Andrew Haig, Best Actor for Andrew Scott, Best Supporting Actress for Claire Foy, Best Supporting Actor for Jamie Bell and Paul Mescal, Best Editing, Best Cinematography, Best Score. If it were up to me, then all of the strangers would have received like nine Oscar nominations. So you can understand my frustration and why it bothers me so much that the Academy didn't give it any recognition whatsoever. Honestly, this is a film that exudes excellence, okay? It touched so many people's hearts, it reduced so many people to tears, but as I expected, it got zero Oscar nominations. But what are the reasons for that? I think it's the nature and the content of the film itself. As it is a film about the gay experience, it was probably viewed by some voters as something that's a little bit too niche for them. But I'd argue that it's not just a gay film. It's a film about loss, grief, loneliness, connection, generational and familial trauma, reconciling with the past. There are so many layers to this film. Labeling it as just a gay film is a disservice because the themes are universal. It is also, however, a ghost story and does feel quite poetic. And perhaps to some viewers, they viewed that as something quite gimmicky, like something that belongs in a stage play and not in a film. I don't agree with that. I think it worked beautifully as a film. It was also a Searchlight film, and I think it probably didn't get as much buzz out of Telluride as Searchlight's other film this year, Poor Things, got straight out of Venice, because that ended up winning the top prize at Venice. And because of that, Searchlight probably felt the need to promote Poor Things more so as their main pony in the award season race. In comparison to Poor Things, All of Us Strangers probably didn't have the same amount of campaign funds and resources. It saddens me that a film where you can clearly see the actors and the filmmaker himself bearing their souls in such a 
raw and vulnerable way wasn't enough to result in Oscar nominations. It truly saddens me that I can't say All of Us Strangers is an Academy Award nominated film. At the very least, it deserved a nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay for Andrew Haig. His writing is just so profoundly human, but Best Adapted Screenplay was such a stacked category this year. And sadly, when Barbie was put back into the adapted screenplay category, it squeezed out any hope of Andrew Haig getting that fifth spot for All of Us Strangers. All five of the Best Adapted Screenplay nominees this year are also up for Best Picture. It really does suck that a truly beautiful film, one which I consider a masterpiece, a term I don't like using very often when I'm talking about movies on the channel, wasn't held in the same regard by enough people in the Academy voter membership. And yet now I have to live in a world where freaking Nyad got more Oscar nominations than all of us strangers did. Yeah, let that sink in. Before we get to number one, I do have some honorable mentions of some other films I think would have been worthy of some Academy recognition. They are Monster, Evil Does Not Exist, Origin, 1001, Dream Scenario, Memory, Eileen, Flora and Son, and Passages. Okay, so last, but by certainly no means least, at number one, the film from 2023 that seems the most baffling that received zero Oscar nominations has to be Sean Durkin's The Iron Claw. Some of you might be wondering, why didn't I put all of the strangers in at number one? Well, the answer for that is, I was actually kind of expecting all of the strangers not to get any Oscars love. However, The Iron Claw is a movie that ticks so many Academy boxes that it feels like it should be nominated for loads of Oscars, and yet, for reasons which I'll discuss shortly, it got zero. I recently rewatched The Iron Claw, and the reason it gets the top spot is because it truly does feel like a film that the Academy would normally nominate the heck out of, but they didn't. No Oscar nominations for you. You got nothing. Zilch. Zero. Nada. <laughs> What nominations could or should it have been nominated for? Well, again, where do I start? This film shines in so many departments. Best actor for Zac Efron, best supporting actor for Holt McCallany, and you can make the argument for some of the other boys in this film as well. Best original screenplay for Sean Durkin, best editing, best cinematography, best costume design, hair and makeup, as well as best director for Sean Durkin, and of course, best picture. So yeah, why? What were the reasons that The Iron Claw was shut out of the Oscars? The main reasons I would say are timing and and a lack of promotion from A24. This film wasn't ready to be seen until late November, early December, and at that point, so many other Oscar contenders had been released and made such an impact on voters. I think The Iron Claw was just a little bit too late to the party, and it just didn't have enough time to catch fire. Often films that are released very early in the year are forgotten about because they run out of steam, but if a film is released too late, then it doesn't have enough time to be seen by enough voters. And again, because there were so many amazing films released prior to The Iron Claw, it makes sense why voters were more invested in those films. Because they've been around in the discourse longer, they've had more time to propagate for the campaigners to get the talent and the crew in the room with voters. I also think it would have been quite taxing and expensive for A24 to launch another aggressive campaign for another one of their movies when they'd already funneled a lot of time, energy, and resources into two of the other films that came out earlier in the year, Past Lives and The Zone of Interest. Two films I am so glad got Oscars recognition. By the time that The Iron Claw was ready to be released, it was too late, and they already had their hands full with the campaigns for two other films. And despite incredible responses from both critics and audiences, there just wasn't enough time to get the ball snowballing on The Iron Claw. Which is a real shame, because I genuinely believe in another year, and another year where the Best Picture category wasn't so stacked, that The Iron Claw had the goods to be a huge juggernaut at the Oscars, even potentially go all the way and win Best Picture. It's a film which elicits a heavy emotional response from both critics and audiences. It's based on a true life story about a family. Recently, the Academy loves a film about a family. Look at Best Picture winners Coda, Parasite, and everything ever all at once. The story has plenty of tragedy in it. The Academy are a sucker for a tearjerker. It's a sports-related biographical drama, which is a genre the Academy usually eats up, so there would have been no genre bias here. 
idea. And it has so many incredible performances in it, like some which actually involve physical transformation like Zac Efron. But you can see what I mean. It's one of those films which ticks so many Academy boxes that it's kind of bonkers to think that this film was completely shut out of not just the Oscars, but the whole of awards season in general. It truly is one of those films that people will look back on and go, how did this film not get any Oscar nominations? Hopefully they're watching this video right now and it's giving you some clarity on why. But it just goes to show how many amazing films that A24 is producing and how they only have so much manpower for the campaigns for certain films. They really have to pick and choose which films they think will have the best chance of being victorious at the Oscars. And because A24 had invested so much time, money and resources in the campaigns for the early releases like Past Lies and The Zone of Interest, it does make sense why a late release like The Iron Claw didn't take off and didn't have enough time for word of mouth and hype to spread about this film. Really, I think it all does come back to timing. I honestly believe if this film had been ready in time for TIFF, then it probably would have won the People's Choice Award at TIFF. This is such a crowd pleaser, even though it's sad. And I do think the word of mouth would have spread at that point, and then it would have gone on to be a real big player at the Oscars. But yeah, what they really should have done is shelved the Iron Claw for release in 2024, because I do genuinely believe in another year, it would have had the goods to go all the way because it would have given the film more time for people to discover it and fall in love with it. But it really does go to show that timing is such a critical factor in a successful Oscars campaign. But yeah, when it comes to films that got zero Oscar nominations in 2023, The Iron Claw is the biggest head scratcher for me, which is why it gets the number one spot on this video. But as always guys, it's just one bloke's opinion. I would love to hear from you. What do you think of my picks? Were there any other movies that you think deserved some Oscars recognition and for what categories? Whatever you have to say about any of the films on this list, do let me know in that comment section down below. If you had enjoyed this video, help me out with the little thumbs up button. It's great for the algorithm. If you want more movie TV and Oscars related content, don't forget to click subscribe. And as always, thanks so much for watching guys. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Kierfield, and I'll see you next time.